is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Gravity Falls, season one, episodes six and seven Dipper versus Manliness and Double Dipper. In these episodes, Dipper learns what it is to be masculine and manly, and uh, he doesn't love it. It's just kind of is like, I don't think this is for me. And then he decides that he's going to create a plan to dance with Wendy. It doesn't go super well, but he does get to live a long cherished dream of mine. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Huge thank you to Rachel for commissioning this episode. I didn't even realize until I went to do my calendar for August that I had another Gravity Falls coming up so soon. For some reason, I thought there was like a really long gap. Um, And I am just really, really excited because I enjoyed these two episodes probably the most out of any so far. So obviously, Dipper versus Manliness has its own whole thing. And I promise I'm going to talk about it. I swear. But I need to get double dipper out of the way because it's something that speaks to me so very in particular. I posted a meme on my Facebook page a couple of uh, days ago, maybe a week now, that said, what fictional character reminds you of me? And Melanie, who's in the chat here right now, and I think Austin Armenio both posted gifts of Mabel. And While I don't disagree, this episode really made me go, ooh, I might be a dipper, though, because this boy loves himself, some plans, loves to-do lists, loves sticking to the thing that he has already figured out for himself, and knows that he can't rely on anybody else to do things, and so it's easier to just make copies of yourself. Guys, if I could just make a copy of myself. I know everybody feels this way. I really do. But this is just something that I recently have felt so strongly. Um, I'm not trying to call anybody out. So person whom this is about, if you are listening, please do not be upset. But I got to talk about it. I have somebody who has been helping me out with organizing some things. And I have been employing them, giving them a stipend. I won't even say I'm paying by the hour, but it's the first time that I have ever had the ability to pay somebody for help. And I recently checked up on some things they were supposed to be managing and it had been almost a month and they had not done any of them. And this person had offered to like help not for money. But I wanted to pay because I felt like that would ensure that these things got done. I'm almost positive that person does not listen to this show either way. And it was just one of those really awful moments because doing what I do and being as small as I am, I have accepted offers of help from people time and time again who really mean it when they say it and who really mean well and who want to be supportive. They genuinely do. But inevitably, they don't follow through. And I'm not trying to be like, mean about it. I'm not trying to be like, bitter at even at all. Because frankly, I get it. I have been that person myself of really meaning well, and then completely forgetting or dropping something entirely and just being, you know, and it's just a hard thing when you have as much to manage as I do. And everything that I do is so very fucking specialized and particular that training someone on how to do it all would take more time than just gone ahead and do it myself. And then after taking the time to train them 
finding out that they actually haven't been doing it for weeks and you trusted so completely that they were taking care of it that you didn't even check because that's how much faith you had. And then it turns out they aren't. It is a massive bummer. And being able to make copies of myself so that I could go to bed and the copy of myself could get up and take care of editing and posting shit and know everything that I know, because that's really the key here. Dipper makes copies of himself, but they aren't just copies that look like him. They are copies that think like him, have the same memories as him, have the same mental processes that he does, and so are having the same thought in the same moment as he is, which fucking sign me up, please. Can you imagine? I just can't like... And yet he still manages to have conversations in which the other version of himself is educating him on who he is. So what if these fucking podcasts were solo episodes because there were two copies of me having a conversation? I mean, how wild would that be? But I just really like deeply want this, even though I know that it's like, it's the kind of thing that is destined to backfire the way that this does. Um, I am frequently, you know, in conflict with myself in what I think is the, the best course of action or whatever. I just, oh, what a lovely time it would be to be able to take a vacation and not have a huge like pile up of stuff to fix by the time I got back. I wouldn't have to play catch up. I would just have it getting done while I was gone Oh, ideal. Such a fantasy situation. So, uh, yeah, I really liked that one. And we will get to it. I just wanted to talk about that off the top because it just, uh, I just want, just let me have it. Somebody, oh God. Um, the only problem is that a whole other copy that's like a real copy, I would guess requires the same like upkeep. Although now I'm thinking about it and what winds up happening is his double drinks a soda and that's what like does him in. So I guess I wouldn't have to feed my copy. Um, but we'll get to that. All right. Backing up. Um, I am really loving Dipper versus Manliness. It's not just because of the indictment of masculinity and not masculinity in general, but what does masculinity mean overall? And there are so many little moments in this episode that I don't think I watched this one twice that I don't think I really caught the first time because I didn't know what the overall theme was going to be. And then when I went back and rewatched it, I was like, oh, there it is. So we start off the episode with this dude who's like kind of got an effeminate look and he's shopping and uh, he's got like, you know, cowboy boots, but he's got denim shorts and like a sleeveless tank top. And he's drawn as like having really exaggerated eyelashes that look sort of feminine as well, but also facial hair. And I really love this to start off the episode because he's just got such a variety of like combinations of things going on that are considered masculine. He's got chest hair and, you know, but then he has some things that for cartoons, like specifically women are drawn with like the eyelashes and the boots and the short shorts. Um, so that right out of the gate, nobody's like making fun of him for like the way that he's dressed here or what he, the whole thing is his attitude. That's the part that's funny because he's so indecisive that they can literally leave and close the place up and go to lunch. And he's just going to stand there being indecisive about a Jaguar or a Puma shirt, which um, honestly, very relatable. I am one of the most indecisive people you'll ever meet. <laughs> and I know that like a lot of people out there probably who listen to the show think that that's nonsense because I am so opinionated and like very rarely change my mind about things. That's not the same thing. Once I decide on an opinion, I'm fine. I will just die believing that and you can go to hell. But I take forever to settle on an opinion of especially something about fucking aesthetic. Get out of here. Like figuring out what looks best. Just go get a coffee and come back because this is not going to be short and it's not going to be pretty. Um, so yeah, 
the whole like fur trout do you have this in another animal like dude this guy is me when i go shopping i don't even like a thing i'm not even intending to buy a thing but i will still be like does this come in pink though like as if i'm gonna buy it i'm not gonna buy it i'm not fooling anybody nobody thinks that i'm gonna buy it but yet here i am um so they go to this diner where lazy susan works puma shirt panther shirt sorry i said jaguar puma panther is better because they're both p words um and this poor old diner is really like just so depressing (laughs) guys have you been places like this because i have only like once or twice and i live in fear of winding up someplace like this again it's first of all called Greasy's, and it's a diner built inside of a combo railroad car and like stump a uh, log on its side. Um, and inside there is a woodpecker that's pecking at the wall and like dropping wood all over this guy's slice of pizza. There is a beaver that comes up out of the ground that is like biting on a piece of the floor. I want this beaver to talk, by the way. He doesn't say something about frolicking, which I was a little bummed about. But yeah, this place is just so... (laughs) And then there's this amazing moment where the two cops are hanging out together. And the one dude is shoving pancakes into his mouth as fast as he possibly can, while the other one uses the uh, speedometer detector, the speed gun, whatever you call it, to track how fast he's shoveling pancakes into his mouth, which honestly, that's one of my favorite jokes ever. I don't know why I found that so funny. I genuinely don't know what it was. But it got me. I think it was how he starts doing it, how the speedometer thing like suddenly jumps into high gear and how intensely the guy holding it just starts to cheer him on because it goes from like, go, go, go to yeah, like really suddenly. I just I fucking I cracked up. I was dying laughing at that part. Oh, my God. Um, So they all sit down and unsurprisingly. Grunkle Stan orders like barely any food for the three of them and is unwilling to pay for anything. And oh man, he's going to give these kids a complex with this. But he's flirting his balls off with Lazy Susan, who has, I, it, it, it took me a minute to understand that her other eye was closed because I thought that she had like monocle or a patch on i didn't realize that that is blue because like she's got blue eyeshadow and i should have been able to tell because her eyelashes are on the bottom on that side but yeah she like lifts that eyelid up to uh blink it so that she can wink at him which just oh my god as somebody with a facial twitch on one side of my face i live in fear of eventually getting to this point (laughs) because like When you think lazy eye, you think somebody who has an eye that looks in a different direction, right? Like an eye that's just sort of, uh, what is it that they say? Like the, the nerves or muscles or something are like just not functioning. And so it doesn't move the same way. Her eyes are facing the same direction. It's just that her lid doesn't lift, which is a lot closer to what I've got going on. Where like if I make if I smile a certain way, my face will just seize up on that side. Um, And I've been getting Botox to help with it because it can loosen up those muscles and make it so that they don't seize up. And it helps, but it's still happening and it will continue to get worse, I'm sure. Um, But anyway, Grunkle Stan has this huge crush on her that is a as adorable as it is inexplicable and he thinks that she's really classy as she's like yelling at the spinning pie display to keep running i love the moment where he asks because mabel's like i wanted pancakes and he says what am i made of money and he kind of swings his arms out and a dollar starts to like slip out of one of his sleeves and he goes tap tap and puts it away It's reminiscent of a joke from Community. I don't know how many of you guys have watched that, but 
the character of Pierce Hawthorne is basically a rich dude who's kind of useless and racist and just like stuck in the past and kind of pathetic. But he has tons of money. And at one point, somebody asks him to go into business with them. And it turns out he doesn't know anything about business. He just has money to spend. And they ask him for a pen. And he reaches into his pocket to get a pen for them. And he keeps just pulling out like loose dollars that start falling everywhere. And they finally lose their patience. And they're like, can you pay somebody to go find a pen? And he goes, yes. And that really felt like this moment to me. <laughs> um, so anyway, they are thinking about how they don't have money to buy breakfast or how he doesn't want to spend it. And... Dipper sees this thing called test your manliness, win game, free pancakes. And it is an amazing, like strong man with the big handlebar mustache, like from a circus who is holding up the sign. And he tells them, don't you all worry about it. I'm going to go and win us some pancakes this morning. And they both fall over laughing. And they're like, dude, look, we don't know how to, say this and like not be mean but you are definitely not going to win shit if manliness is the thing that's being measured no offense you're a wiener you're a wimp you're pathetic not going to happen and they're not like that bald about it but they are just as mean the way they're laughing it obviously like really gets under his skin and irritates him and he is determined to prove them wrong and he goes over there and it is quite a sad display. He, uh, I love that Grunkle Stan tells him, you smell like baby wipes, <laughs> which somehow is so fucking cutting and terrible. And then he says, and don't forget about last Tuesday's incident. And we get a flashback of Dipper combing his hair and singing into his comb in his towel, the equivalent song of Dancing Queen. But it's called Disco Girl by Icelandic pop sensation Baba, which, uh, guys, one of my favorite tropes in this show is their remaking of classic songs that are very recognizable, despite not actually being the same song. You hear him singing Disco Girl. Is there an instant where you don't know that's Dancing Queen? You fucking immediately know, absolutely without a doubt, that is Dancing Queen. And later on in the next episode, when Don't Stop Believing, like she says, the rock ballad is, and you don't even need to know what they're going to play. You know it's going to be Don't Stop Believing. They put the name up. It's obvious. But then it starts playing and you're like, you didn't have to have her say that. You didn't have to have me see the name of the song. I know what song this is. You don't even need to worry about it. Like... I just love that and I can't wait to see how many more times this winds up coming up because there is, it's sort of similar to like this one of my favorite jokes and this may make me sound like a fool and maybe I am guys I could be you know what I am it's fine one of my favorite jokes invariably that makes me laugh even when I'm like mad even when I'm not in the mood to laugh is somebody slightly mispronouncing a thing like and not like they mispronounce it like they don't know what the word is although that works also it's things like this where you're obviously referencing something else but you just spell it slightly differently because you're afraid of a lawsuit or because you just don't want to like you know like there's a joke in uh 30 rock where she goes to this like old-fashioned town that's really backwards and she just wants some Schweppes ginger ale and she gets the can and it says Schweppes ginny pail which I swear to god guys I don't know why I find that so funny and these songs are like a giant version of that you know like we're gonna make it sound so much the same that you know but it's not exactly the same we're gonna have the words be basically like the same but totally not so that it's way funnier it's just I it's like weird Al in miniature, you know, I love it. I love it so much. So yeah, his uncle caught him singing to this and just decides that this means that he's way too girly and not a man. And uh, he gets up and he goes and does this like little competitive thing. And it really 
it lights up wimp and then it prints out something and when he reads it it says you are a cutie patootie and it's a picture of a baby farting guys because of patootie i'm pretty positive that's supposed to be a toot pun i'm pretty sure it's so stupid (laughs) oh i love the show so he of course is like well i guess this thing is broken and uh you know it's uh really old and just doesn't do anything and oh uh, uh." and then here comes red-haired lumberjack man who presses the thing with literally his pinky finger in the gentlest tap and it shoots all the way up to manly man and the strong man from the circus that's at the top holding the sign explodes he hits the plate of pancakes that are sitting there and everybody gets a pancake dropped onto their plates and the whole diner is cheering and poor dipper has to stand there and watch as he is humiliated and everybody gets pancakes because of somebody that he is now trying to see as a rival. I say trying because they are not, in fact, rivals at all. And he gets a pancake dropped on his head. And then he tries to leave and he trips and falls on his way out. And it's just really embarrassing. It's really embarrassing. Meanwhile, Mabel is talking to Grunkle Stan. Manly Dan, is that his name, Melanie? I didn't even notice that. Oh, my God. Manly Dan. All right, sure. Why not? Um, Meanwhile, Mabel is sitting with Grunkle Stan and she tries to like joke around with him because he looks at uh, Dipper running out and he says, how am I related to that? And she's like, well, I bet you have a soft side. And he tries to deny it. And Lazy Susan walks up and he completely like fucks up his sentence. And when she walks away, Mabel's like, holy shit, you're in love with her. That's where it is. Oh, my God. And he's like, well, I don't even have a chance with her. Who even cares? Look at how classy she is. And this leads to a makeover subplot in which she is going to get him to be more classy. And I just really love the duality in this episode because if you are really paying attention everything that she is doing to make over grunkle stan to get him to be more classy is the opposite of what dipper is having happen on his end with the manators like you know he's desperately trying to grow chest hair while she's trying to shave grunkle stan's chest hair they're trying to like make his you know make him tougher and get scars and tattoos while she's trying to smooth his skin and give him facials everything about them is is juxtaposed so like at one point he's stands up straighter and sucks in his stomach so that his chest is larger so that he just looks a little like better posture and like he's got like he's more uh heavy through the shoulders than the gut meanwhile the manators all slump over and they let their guts hang because being a man means like being relaxed and not constantly worrying about how you look it's just such a beautiful little like be what being masculine is is such a narrow definition according to society that you go too far in either direction and you're no longer acceptable. There's just this tiny middle road that is supposed to be followed by everybody. And if it's just like kind of an impossible thing to manage for a lot of people. And it's such a shame because like, I see so much guys. I don't know how many of you have like people on your Facebooks that are, not woke that don't really understand the gender binary or the sort of damaging effects that it can have i am friends with people who are either actually trans non-binary um or just very supportive of expressing genders outside of the binary and so i forget 
exactly how unwelcoming the world is still. Like, in my bubble, it feels like this is something we've come a long way on. And then the moment that you go to any sort of public post where there's a dude wearing eyeliner, people are acting like they are literally going to be thrown into a lake of fire. And I'm not kidding. That was a comment that was said because Victoria's Secret just hired its first trans model. And this person shared pictures of this trans model who is stunning BT dubs. And one, the first comment was, this is how Satan lures us into the lake of fire. Yeah, because somebody who's assigned gender at birth was male, decides they don't like that, and they want to wear makeup and bikinis. That's definitely what's going to lead. Not mass shootings, not allowing the poor to die because they don't have the money to pay for health care. Those aren't the things. It's this person wearing something I don't like. What is up with people? Guys, sincerely, why is this what the hill that they choose to die on? Who fucking cares? Who cares? Oh my God, who cares? Nobody is asking for you to personally, like, go out and change the way that you identify to the world. And that's what I think this comes from is this fear of like, oh, well, if gender isn't something that we accept as a binary anymore, then they're going to demand that I conform. Wow, really? You're afraid of being forced to conform to a gender you don't identify with? What is that like? Super weird. Why would you why do you think that that would be stressful? Hmm? Do you think that sounds like a bad thing to live through? Do you? Do you? I'm just saying. So anyway, back to Dipper. He goes out into the woods and he's trying to like, I want to say weightlift, but that's not accurate. He has a twig that he's trying to bench press <laughs> and he can't do it. And he even has this amazing fucking beef jerky that just straight up says you're inadequate on it. <laughs> And um, it is like he summons this manator into his midst. This manator who has lots of body and facial hair, who has the male symbol tattooed on his bicep. This manator is not here to play. And yet I did really like that despite these manators representing a lot of what's like toxic about masculinity, he still is like, I smell emotional upheaval and like invites Dipper to come and lay his head in his lap and tell him about what's been going on, which honestly, these manators can have all these other toxic qualities. But if they manage to do this, that's still better than most men in the world. Honestly, this is like an improvement still. It really, truly is. Being able to be like, dude, it seems like uh, you're upset. You want to talk about it? I There are so many studies out there recently coming up that are pointing out, and this is something, again, I love about our examining of gender roles because it's the sort of thing that women know, but we have not had the language to express what we feel and we have not had enough like contact with other women or the ability to express what we're experiencing so that we can confirm with other women that they are also going through this thing because it's a hard thing to put into words. But what it is, is that a lot of men, it turns out, leave relationships better than they like felt when they went into them. Like their confidence is higher, their peace of mind is higher, while the woman is left a lot more broken oftentimes. And it turns out that while they are in the relationship, men are not trained to foster friendships with other men the way that women are taught to foster friendships with women. Women are taught that 
when we get together, we pour our guts out. We have some drinks. We really talk. It's a very feminine thing to be seen having like conversations about how you're feeling and doing. Men are taught that their friendships should consist of getting drunk and going to strip clubs and ogling women and playing sports. And they are, the idea of sharing what's happening is just so secondary as to not even really be a factor. And thus, in relationships, men wind up draining women of a lot of energy because since they have no friends to talk about their problems with, they depend entirely on a woman that they are also romantically involved with to do all of this additional emotional labor while that woman has other resources to take care of that for her. So a lot of men wind up completely depending on this one partner for all of their emotional needs bordering on straight up therapy, while women are often taught that they should not share all of their problems with their man because that is seen as looking quite like quote looking crazy. And frankly, probably a lot of the things they want to share are frustrations about the relationship. So they go to their friends about it. And it just leads to this really lopsided structure of emotional labor that winds up burning out women really fast. And the man who is buoyed by this attention and care that they're getting for free from their partner walks out of that relationship mystified as to why she is tired and exhausted and doesn't want to put up with their shit anymore. But they feel great and they move on to the next relationship without understanding what the problem is. So as somebody who has been that person and has noticed, like in my previous marriage, I actually talked to my husband about it because I was just like, you don't really have friends. Like you don't have people that you go to when you're upset. Like I do. I have people to call. I can call my mom. I can call a couple of friends of mine. I can have people come over. Like you don't have that. Don't you think that's weird? And he didn't really. And this moment with the Manitar, like they, at the end, it turns out this is not what Dipper really wants, but it's so kind of like, it, it's still such a step forward initially that they sit and listen to him and invite him to help him like work through this, that I still see it as an improvement on how masculinity is treated ordinarily in our culture. Um, so anyway, yeah. He winds up getting um, inducted into this group. They like at first they don't want to. They don't want to teach him because he's a human and they just don't like they're not ready to take it on. And he kind of like reverse psychologies them into doing it because he says that they're just afraid that they uh, can't do it which is really smart of him. Um, I should mention too, that the lead up to him, like running into the woods is him backing into a girl on the street by accident. And she turns and says, Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking for the mailman. And he's like, well, what is that supposed to mean? Are you saying I'm not a male man? Are you saying that? Is that what you're trying to say? I'm not male. I'm, I'm not a man. Is that what you're getting at? And he turns and stares at her and the camera is on her. And then she just goes, are you crying? And he just runs away. <sighs> Guys, I swear to God. I just love that moment. So they wind up uh, teaching, like putting him through a series of rigorous tests and trials to make him a man all from the comfort of their man cave, which has darts and foosball and weightlifting. And it is amazing. Guys, I just love it so much. There's so much about it. All these little jokes. The man cave, first of all, right there is just great. He goes and introduces him to all of them with their names. Um, and I have it up here. Hold on. This that is pubitar, testosterone, pituitor, uh, and I'm chutzpar. And they ask what his name is, and he says Dipper, and everybody is like, Dipper, 
really. Which we find out where that that comes from in the next episode. But he then is like the destroyer. And they're like, yep, okay, that's better. Definitely an improvement. Um, Again, I would really like to point out how weird it is that we associate masculinity with destroying things, with killing things, just saying. So all of these different, like, trials that he's put through he, there's a pain hole that he's got to put his hand in which reminds me of the like box from dune um i don't know if any of you have listened to my episode covering dune i think i did that one with liz roller i hated that book i hated it so much but uh you know go listen to that if you want to hear me hate something and he has to like pull wagons that are filled with all of these dudes which it doesn't seem like it's going to actually it's not moving um i love how this is like interspersed with the makeover of grunkle stan and i love that mabel comes up with this training mix that she made that she puts on and it's somebody narrating everything that's happening and it's like if you guys have seen the rocky movies it is no exaggeration of any kind. This is precisely what the training montage songs sound like. Exactly. If I didn't have the lyrics to hear, if they just played the music, I would 100% think this was one of those songs. It wouldn't even occur to me to question it. Like, it's so on point. I love it so much. Um so, yeah, like she's shaving Grunkle Stan's chest. Meanwhile, Dipper is getting glue poured on his chest and the Manators are like tearing off some of their own hair and sticking it on. Grunkle Stan is like, you know, learning how to have better posture with books balanced atop his head. Meanwhile, Dipper is trying to walk across a bog filled with alligators Um she is like talking about the importance of eye contact while they're holding Dipper's eyes open to stare at like posters that say courage and honor. Um, it's just, there is so much about it that I just love. And all of the lyrics of the song are just talking about what is happening. I don't really know what's happening in this part. It actually says at one point, uh, this is good stuff, guys. It's just good stuff. So in the end, it turns out that there is a greater leader of all of the Manator. And he is, oh my God. Yeah. Melanie's just saying right now, I love Dipper's temporary tattoos. Yeah. On one side, it says too cool. And on the other side, I think it says rad dude. Um, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. And he's like running around on a loincloth with a spear by this point. Like, yeah, it's amazing. But this, this high manator tells him basically, you got to go kill this, uh, multi bear for us. And then you're a man. And he's like, all right, cool. I'll, I'll go do that. And honestly, handles himself pretty damn well. All things considered at figuring out where it is at, managing to get through the woods without hurting himself. He's uh, drinking from a stream next to a deer and gives the deer a nod and it nods back. Like it's all wonderful. So he reaches this cave and the multi bear is in there and it has six heads and it is like basically really tired of being bullied by the manators who constantly make fun of him because he likes, guess what? Disco girl. And that moment of realization, Dipper just like, can't do it. He's just realizing like, oh, what? I have to kill this part of myself that loves this thing that is totally harmless. Why am I worried about it? Why is anybody else worried about it? Just let me listen to the fucking song, you jags. Who cares? And he goes back and tells them that he can't do it. And I really particularly love that in my little mind, all I'm thinking is he's going to say, that's not what it means to be a man. I'm going to like what I like. And they're all going to be like, oh, maybe you're right. That was the test all along, perhaps, you know, like something like, oh, it was all a trick. And being a man really does mean deciding for yourself what it means to be a man. And we've set you up to figure all of this out. Nope. 
it's just what it looks like. He's supposed to do the thing. And if he doesn't, he's not a man and he's exiled. And that's the end of that. And I kind of love that the show doesn't equivocate on that. And they just are like, yeah, no, the thing that society tells you is exactly what they expect. It's not some like mental game for them. They want you to conform. If you don't, they won't like you and they will not be like supportive of you and you have to be okay with that and i think that's like really important not that oh everybody's going to ascend to the same understanding that you have they're not all going to be like awakened and get woke at the same time as you they are going to continue thinking what they've always thought and it's up to you to do what you think is right anyway which is really hard spoiler alert just fyi um, so yeah, I just really appreciated that there was like no real equivocating on that. And he goes back home and is kind of like bummed out because he feels like maybe I don't, maybe I'm just never going to be a man, you know? Meanwhile, Grunkle Stan, after this whole makeover is over, looks so much worse than he did before. He's covered in all of this like spiky growth because his hair that they shaved off is growing back. So it looks really weird. He's like slumped over more than usual. His shirt has puke on it. One of his slippers is missing. There's flies buzzing around him. He's got a Q-tip stuck in his ear. And Mabel is just like, dude, what in the fuck? How is, do you look so terrible? What do you mean? So, all of a sudden, when he says something about like, um, I, I think it's actually Wendy who's sitting next to Mabel at this point, And she says something like, uh, I'm trying to go back. Maybe your uncle's unfixable, like that spinning pie trolley thing in the diner. And that gives Mabel an idea. And she tells him to come with her and leave his pants at home. So they go to the diner. And Lazy Susan, precious baby, uh, it turns out, is interested. But Grunkle Stan doesn't get it right away. He walks in there in his nasty undershirt with his shorts. Guys, I'm just going to... This. She's still banging on that fucking pie display when they walk in. And Mabel leads him in. And says, I know he's not much to look at, but you're always fixing stuff in the diner. And if you like fixing stuff, nothing could use more fixing than my grunkle Stan. Also, women live longer than men. So your dating pool is smaller. Uh, what is it that she says? Your dating pool is smaller. I missed it. I want to get it right. Sorry, guys. Your dating pool is smaller and you should really lower your standards. Like, honestly, guys, this is so depressing. First of all, women who want to date men that they need to fix, just run. Just don't do it. Women live longer than men. Like, don't waste the, t the long life you have on dudes like this. But anyway, he says, what do you say? And she looks him over and walks away. And they start to leave because he assumes nothing. And she's like, here's my number. Why don't you give me a call sometime? And later on, we see her calling him and leaving a message with every single one of the cats meowing, which I just found charming and terrible, but it's great. Um, and she pulls out a, uh, a piece of pie. And tells him this for him. And they sit down and Grunkle Stan starts to eat it. And immediately Mabel's like, when do you want to call her? Should you call her now? We don't have a phone. Let's get a phone. We can buy it. We can buy a phone right now. We can put it on a credit card. Let's get a credit card. And he's just like, can I just eat my pie? <laughs> Come on. And this is when Dipper walks up. And it's sort of precious. He's just like talking to them about they wanted me to do this really horrible thing and it wasn't right. So I said, no. And Grunkle Stan says you were your own man and you stood up for yourself. You did what was right, even though no one agreed with you. Sounds pretty manly to me, but what do I know? And I love this. Dipper sits back and is like, oh shit, I didn't even think of that. And Mabel notices that he has a chest hair. 
and he's very excited about it. Um, so he points out his chest hair to his uncle. Mabel plucks it and puts it in the scrapbook, which I just love so much. And Grunkle Stan says, oh, there's more when that came, where that came from and opens his shirt. And Dipper winds up telling him that that's really gross. And I'm like, on the one hand, I really think probably if I was sitting across from a dude like Grunkle Stan and he ripped his shirt open, I would also be like, dude, that's gross. But personally, I love chest hair so much, you guys. Like, I know that it has been the style over the past, like, two decades for dudes to have completely smooth, hairless chests, both in television, in movies, and on posters, and in, like, underwear ads and everything. I don't like it. Guys, you better have some hair on your chest, I'm telling you. Because, like, mm -mm. Owen was so self-conscious about his chest hair when we started dating and refused to believe that I genuinely meant it when I said that I liked it. Like, he really thought, I think, that I was just trying to be nice. And that was so not it at all. I just really do like it. Um, but, you know, that doesn't make you less or more of a man. Just saying. So that's the end of that episode. And it's great. And then we go into Double Dipper. And this is basically this one's a lot simpler. Like the other one has all this sort of social baggage with it. So it took me a lot longer to talk about. But this one's a lot more straightforward. He still has this crush on Wendy. And he's still trying to find a way to date her or at least like get her interested and like, you know, considering him in in a romantic way at all. And the whole thing is, you know, they're setting it up like it's this birthday party, but it's actually a like farce that's being done just so that he can get people to come in to the mystery shack a little bit more often. And I love the poster that says free question mark to advertise it. Um, and they have to make copies of this flyer to hang up all over the place and give to people. And Grunkle Stan says that he fixed the old copier good as new so they can use that instead. And they find this fucking busted machine covered in cobwebs. There's flies and moths all over the place. And they are testing it out and Dipper puts his arm over it and it copies a photo of his arm and it looks like everything is working the way it's supposed to. But then Mabel picks up the paper and that image of his arm comes to life and begins to drag itself all across the floor, having turned into a three dimensional copy of his arm. And it's a pretty awesome, like, little trope moment, too. And I love the fact that they've been playing with Silly String the whole time. And she's like, do you realize what this means when they've made this discovery? But then she just pulls the Silly String out and just shoots him in the face with it. I love it. Because we know that this is called Double Dipper. We are aware that, like, what's coming. So when she says, do you realize what this means? We're all set as viewers to be like, ooh, you're going to make copies of yourselves. But nope, Mabel's not actually thinking about this. She's not even that impressed. She's just basically like, oh, shit. Yeah, we can, uh, we can, you know, keep playing the thing that we were playing before that I like much better than this conversation. Um, so he gets asked by Grunkle Stan to man the, the basically ticket counter in the front booth where they take money before people come into the party. And at first he's not excited, but then he sees that Wendy is going to be there with him and he's very, very happy about it. And he takes all this time to make himself look cute and puts on a bow tie and the whole thing. And Mabel knows precisely what the fuck is up. And he says, yeah, you can make fun of me, but I have created a plan and she says, oh, God, an overcomplicated list. Are you really doing this? And I love it. He's like, overcomplicated. Get out of here. And he pulls out this seemingly small, like it looks like the size of like an index card. But then he unfolds it and it hits the ground and like unfolds more. And it's huge. And it's like step by step list 
And she sits down and stares at him with this expression on her face. She has no patience for this. This sounds like a dumb idea for poop heads. I wish that I would occasionally have a Mabel in my life to tell me that maybe I'm being dumb and doing things that are for poop heads. And there's this awesome fantasy scene where Dipper is like two feet taller than he actually is. And he's wearing a tux, but still has his like hat on. And he's dancing with Wendy and dips her as she tells him how much basically his lists turn her on. (laughs) Oh God, I love it. And he says, nothing can get on my way, can get in my way. And she says, dude, you get in your own way. Why can't you just talk to her like a normal person? And he points out that step nine says, talk to her like a normal person. Guys, I felt this in my soul. Somebody being like, why don't you just do this thing? And then me being like, oh, that thing's on the list. Oh, my God. That is such Natasha behavior. (laughs) Called out. Called out. So we go to the party and it's amazing. First of all, Grunkle Stan has this like shirt on. Uh, He's just very excited about this whole thing. Meanwhile, Seuss is using his like weird little uh, soundboard that's on the, what do you call it? On the keyboard to like just make noises. And they're they're getting all the people who came in are getting charged to leave. So there are people who are like basically trapped inside. But when they go stand by the window, like they're trying to get out, it just makes it look like the party is more full. And people keep coming in. It winds up actually working out to be a pretty big crowd. Um, Meanwhile, Dipper's trying to have just a regular conversation with Wendy and he is not doing well. And finally, Wendy is like, all right, I'm going to go kind of dick around because that's how she is and leaves him. I have to say, I really like the fact that Seuss is the fat character that's like really goofy but despite that and the the usual association of fat being lazy, they make the character that fucks off at work and does not do what she's meant to do. The skinny character. I appreciate that a lot. Like, you know, so she goes off and he realizes that, like, he can't be two places at once. And everything in his, like, uh, mission is going to fall apart if she doesn't stay next to him at the uh, the front table. So he decides to go make copies of himself to handle things. And it starts to get more and more out of control until there's like 10 copies of him so that they can all do things to ensure people wind up exactly where they need to be. Because, for example, at one point, he has them steal the motorbike of uh, the kid that she keeps talking to, who I forget his name. Is it Roy? Roger? Robert? I feel like it's an R. Um So, yeah, things like that, that he keeps needing extra copies of himself so that he can be everywhere and and control every single little moment of the conversations that they're having. And the way that, like, the room is set up, who's here, who's not, how the lighting is, what's playing on the radio at the time. Like, he wants to have control over everything, which hashtag same, honestly. Like, I feel him on this. I really, really do. Meanwhile, Mabel is out here making friends because there is this really huge girl. And I don't just mean huge fat. I mean, huge tall. Also, she's like six feet tall, who has an iguana on her shoulder and then a tiny girl who reads as Asian. And they are the nerds hanging out in the corner at this party, Grenda and Candy Uh, Why do you have forks taped to your fingers? And she sticks them into the bowl of popcorn, pulls her fingers out, and there's popcorn stuck to the end of each tiny fork. She says, improvement of human being. And Mabel says, I found my people. 
And it's a beautiful moment. I think we've all had this where we've like encountered people who just do something that's just your kind of weird. And you're like, oh, here we are. Yes, sir. We're about to be friends. Um, and this whole thing, this subplot leads to this like competition for what's basically boils down to par- uh, prom queen. It's a party crown. And she is going to be competing against Pacifica Northwest, who is the most popular girl in this town. And she is not prepared for competition from Mabel for the crown. And they decide to go up head to head. And Mabel, who is very nice to her and never really like stoops to the same place as Pacifica in terms of making fun of anybody or saying anything back to her that's quite as snotty. She's still like, she's so nice that that is what annoys Pacifica, which I really enjoy. And they go head to head in this way that is so charming and adorable and little girlish. And in the end, Pacifica winds up winning, even though, of course, we all need Mabel to win. We all want Mabel to win. We want the Mabels of the world to win. That is not what happens. Mabel almost wins. It's such a close thing. And it turns out there's like one person. I'm not even remembering exactly how this went where when they do the vote. There's like one person that's sort of a ringer in the crowd, I think. Um, but yeah, they Pacifica winds up winning. And it's unfair, of course. And Seuss, who's the one that's calling who's going to win, is not excited about the fact that his buddy Mabel doesn't. At first, it's a tie. And he says this has never happened before. Um Oh, that's right. Pacifica goes over and waves a dollar near the uh, face of the local kook, who then begins clapping. And that's just enough to send the, like, Seuss meter over the edge. I forgot that's how it was. So she wins because she pays somebody to clap for her, which just feels so, like, on brand, doesn't it? It really is just... So Mabel really kind of won but it's fine because Mabel doesn't give a shit she's like all right you can win this thing I don't care I still have two new friends that are awesome and we are going to have a sleepover and you guys are bringing magazines uh with with boys in them and we're going to hang out with your lizard and eat popcorn and it's going to be great so I love this so much. She's like, I understand if you want to leave. And they're like, what are you talking about? Absolutely fucking not. You're a rock star. This was super fun. We told our parents we're going to stay here. And she's like, oh, okay. So it's wonderful. Meanwhile, oh, and she says, maybe we don't have as many friends as Pacifica, but we have each other. And that is pretty good, I think. And this is one of those things that I have personally always struggled with because like I don't do well with large groups of friends. I really prefer to have a couple people that I really confide in and have serious conversations with and get to know really well. And, but I do love big parties. And so it can be hard because I want people like around for celebrations like that, just like for fun, but I don't necessarily want to like hang out with them as a group often. Um, but anyway, that winds up with a happy ending. Seuss keeps playing music even though everybody else has left. So these three are the only ones on the dance floor and it's wonderful. Meanwhile, Dipper is just overdoing everything. And it, it, all it takes is that poor Wendy has to use the bathroom to completely throw off his entire plan. And... He decides like, oh, I'm actually having a good time just talking to her. I don't need to follow this plan. And all the other versions of him are like, excuse me? Yeah, no, that's not how we're doing this. We're doing the plan. We're doing the plan. What are you? We're doing the plan. Shut up. So they, he 
winds up taking them all down because they're basically made of paper in essence. So he can just pour soda on them and they just dissolve. And there's only one left and they actually kind of get along. They're actually able to like put aside their differences and be like, you know what? And watch as she hangs out and jokes around with the dude that they've seen as their rival this whole time. And they're like low key, like, uh, I guess we fucked it up and blew it. Cool beans. But as it turns out, later on when they're talking, Dipper is like, you know, I'm not even sure that we even have a chance with her in the first place. I keep acting like I screwed it up, but I don't know that there was an it to screw up, actually, because she's 15 and I'm only 12. And the other guy is like, you know what? Either way, you do really need to learn how to just go with the flow and get out of your own way. Like Mabel was right. And... Then they smile and each swigs some soda and the other guy is like, ah, shit, as he looks down and sees that he is starting to dissolve because he's not supposed to drink soda. Whoops. And poor Dipper has to say goodbye to him as he like melts into a puddle of goo. And it's sort of like adorable and sad because this was his friend. Um, But it ends on a happy note with Dipper being able to like be around Wendy without making a complete ass of himself with uh, Grunkle Stan having a big pile of money that he gets to cut up and or that he gets to count up and, uh, you know, feeling like he really did something tonight. And uh, Mabel and all of her friends dancing and Seuss getting to play with the sound effects on this keyboard, which I definitely used to own a keyboard that did this. So I know all about it. And I thought it was a really cute episode. So yeah, I like these two. Um, I'm over time, so I'm going to have to wrap this up. But thank you again to Rachel for commissioning this. Thank you to Melanie for being in the chat and feeding me some names. I hope that you guys are enjoying this coverage. And I will see you soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.